Um, for those people who are new to the hobby, I thought I'd just explain what, what I think these mean. So a bird watcher is really anybody who's interested in birds, goes out and watches birds, has a pair of binoculars, maybe goes for a walk every week and so on. A birder, well, a birder tends to be um, a little bit more of an obsessive with birding. So literally, like me, birding is everything in your life. When I switch my camera on, you'll see I've got a wall-to-wall -wall room of books here of birds. Um, so a birder, I think, really is the phrase we use for people who really are into it. And it's their life's mission, frankly. Ornithologist, well, when I was a kid, I used to be a member of the Young Ornithologists Club. Some of you would have been too, I expect. The word ornithologist doesn't get used very much now, um, but it very much is the scientific end of the study of birds, of ornithology. And then twitcher. Well, of course, in the media, we're all twitchers, aren't we? It's really annoying. But uh, for me, a twitcher is somebody who really gets their high from going to see a rare bird, something that wasn't expected. Quite happy to, to drive many, many miles to see it, um, probably through the night. Um, and yeah, there's a dedicated band of twitchers. They're generally well behaved, actually. I know they get portrayed as being villains, but they're not. Um, just a few idiots amongst them that uh, jump fences and do stupid things. So how many bird watchers? Well, the RSPB's got 1.2 million members. Now, not all of those are bird watchers of the type that I described at the top of that list. I'd say that um, maybe 10% of those are bird watchers. The others are um, people who like birds, but, but probably don't know very much about them beyond feeding in the garden. Um, and of the, so if you say 10%, so 120,000 are bird watchers, probably within that, I'd say that um, maybe, maybe 20,000 of those are birders, really, really, really keen. Um, Hoss, we have 2,200 members, if you take into consideration all the home addresses we've got and joint member memberships of, of couples and, and families and so on. So that's what we do. Now, how many bird species are there? That's an often, uh, often asked question. So the answer is about 11,000. And that number is increasing all the time because as the understanding of DNA becomes better, we are more able to determine between two species that uh, actually are different but look exactly the same and, and may even live alongside each other. So we are finding species still, even though of course some are becoming extinct and a bit more about that later. In the UK we have about 220 breeding species and we've got about another 100 that join us for the winter or pass through on their way to somewhere else. Um, so every year um, something like 360 species are seen. Um, in Hampshire, the figure is 140 breeding species and about 75 that join us briefly as they pass through on their way to somewhere else. So if you want to see um, birds in Hampshire, 200 in a year is, is certainly achievable. I think the record is something like 230. Uh, but that person had to go out pretty much every day of the year and probably miss their wedding as well, I expect. <laughs> Well, the first bird 150 million years ago was the Archaeopteryx, which uh, is, you can see here in this fossil record from Germany. This was the very first bird. This is the time when there were dinosaurs on the planet. And indeed, the Archaeopteryx probably looked a bit like this. It's believed it <laughs> basically developed from being like a, uh, being a reptile wow. in the trees that developed wings yeah, because right. it wanted to jump from one to the other. Uh... Um, whoever the lady is just talking, if you wouldn't mind muting yourself, that would be fabulous. Um, thank you. Um, bird diversity. So around the world, we've got uh, a lot of areas where birds are very dense in the, the number of species and also areas where there are very few. So, for example, if you look in the top part of Africa, there are hardly any birds because it's the Sahara Desert. And similarly, if you look in the Afri in, in Australia, the western half of that, again, not many birds. Similarly, up the top of North America and Siberia. But look in South America, look in areas like Brazil, Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, absolutely full of birds, many, many species. And similarly, in parts of East Africa and parts of West Africa and also in parts of Southeast Asia. So, so birds are not distributed equally around the world. It's actually uh, a real sort of feast or famine in terms of what you see in some places. 
Some groups like the ducks, geese and swans are really widely distributed. They're found absolutely everywhere. In fact, um, you know, in the Arctic, uh, in the Antarctic or, or near to the Antarctic. Some groups like hummingbirds are only found on one side of the world. So hummingbirds are only found in North America and South America. And very similar looking sunbirds are only found in Africa and parts of Asia, even though they look a bit like hummingbirds. So they all carve out their own niche and they're found in, in different areas. But some, as I said, like the ducks are found pretty much right around the world. So when did birds evolve? As I mentioned, Archaeopteryx was with us 150 million years ago. Um, well, it depends on who you believe, really. Uh, but four and a half billion years ago, Earth started to become uh, the planet uh, that we know, um, although not in the form that we know it now. Birds around 150 million years ago. We probably turned up in one form or another about a million years ago. Um, and, um, you know, it's amazing because birds have been here 150 times longer than us and yet everything that affects their lives pretty much comes from what we do as humans. 161 bird species have become extinct since 1500 and already this century, since 2000, we've had eight species that have gone as far as we know. And currently one in eight species is currently declining and some of them are declining at a speed um, that suggests that we will become extinct very soon. So it's a bit of a depressing situation, I'm afraid. If you look at the birds um, of the 11,000 species, well, um, 8,500 we're not too worried about because they're doing okay, they're not declining. About another thousand are looking near threatened, so they're basically a bit poorly in terms of their status, but they're not actually declining fast. And then the ones in red you can see, vulnerable, endangered, critically endangered, they're the ones that are rapidly disappearing. 222 species are critically endangered. In other words, if we don't do something for them, we're going to end up losing them, uh, probably in our lifetimes. And there are 58 species which we call data deficient because actually we hardly ever see them. So we don't really know whether they're okay or not. So, uh, so that's, that's the situation. It's a bit worrying, I must say. So let's have a look at Hampshire, how many we got? Well, in total, 382 species, I think, or plus or minus a couple, because it might have changed since I did this slide, have, um, have basically um, been seen in Hampshire. 110 are here all the time. 48 come for the winter. 28 only come here for the summer. 26 pass through. And then 169 are rarities. So you can see why the twitchers have a good time. Hampshire's a very good county for seeing unusual birds. Some of them are gone already. The black grouse, amazingly, did used to be in Hampshire, probably about, well, about 100 years ago uh, in the New Forest. Um, but Montague's Harrier's gone, Rhineck, Dipper, Windchat, Wheatier, Tree Sparrow and Ruddy Duck. Now, they've all gone as breeding species. We do see some of them, Wheatiers and Windchats, of course, um, come through on their migration, but they've gone from Hampshire as breeding species. Um, and it's incredible. Up to the 1920s, there were black grouse in the New Forest. I think they probably were put there. I don't think they got there naturally. I think somebody probably opened a box and let a few out, maybe because they wanted to shoot them. And they were also seen on some of the heaths in the northern parts of Hampshire too. We've got some others which are actually declining quite fast. These are actually declining in most of the areas of southern England. Grey partridge, turtle dove, wood warbler, grasshopper warbler, willow tit, spotted flycatcher and corn bunting. Interestingly, corn bunting seems to have turned the corner and is now increasing in Hampshire. There's a very good population of them to the west of Hampshire, and that may well mean that the birds are spilling into our areas. It could also be because farmers are doing an awful lot to try and encourage corn buntings on their land. But these are all birds that are declining, and indeed, some of them we're going to lose, I would imagine we'll probably lose willow tit as a breeding species in about five years or so, maybe 10 years. Um, You've probably seen the debate about Chris Packham's willow tits in the New Forest. Um, far be it from me to say he's wrong, but I'd like to see a photo because they are incredibly rare and only found now in areas above 170 metres. New arrivals though, it's not all bad news. Um, so I popped up in 1960 and since that time these are the species that have started to breed in Hampshire. None of these were breeding in Hampshire before then. So you can see them there. I mean, little egrets arrived about 
20 years or so ago um, and are doing well. Egyptian goose, goodness me, everywhere it seems at the moment in the Avon Valley and in northern Hampshire. Ida is just the one pair. They, they nest every year in Key Haven. Um, it's incredible, really. Uh, the only nesting pair, I think, in southern England. And the rest of them you can see there, and the stories about most of those are quite well known um, about how they got here. Red kite with our help because we released them. Goshawks, again, probably released by falconers or maybe they escaped. Peregrines got here. Uh, they were here already, but they weren't breeding in Hampshire until 1993. And that's partly because all the pressures on them were taken away. And then the others like Mediterranean gull and yellow leg gull and Chetty's warbler well, and firecrest actually, they're all indicators actually of a warming climate. These are mainly Mediterranean species, species that like it to be a bit warmer and therefore are happy to be with us now in Hampshire. Now, one of the questions I'm often asked is, what are the largest and the smallest? So here they are, the ostrich at 120 kil kilograms, pretty big, um, and bee hummingbird at two grams. And there they both are on that, uh, on that slide. The bee hummingbird is only found in Cuba. Ostrich, well, there are two species of ostrich, but they're found uh, only in Africa. Um, and <clears throat> here are their eggs. You've got the bee hummingbird egg in the, between the fingers there and the ostrich egg. Uh, quite remarkable that birds can come up with those solutions, uh, both the same, but both so different in size. The ostrich is also the fastest bird. It can run faster than any other bird on, on land. Anyway, it can't fast fly <laughs> and it can't go as fast as peregrine, but it can run uh, very fast indeed. It's got the largest uh, brain of any bird. It's got the largest eyeball of any bird as well. And it's the heaviest bird too. Fastest bird? Well, any child in school these days seems to know this one, I find. I do a few talks in school and are all talking about peregrines. So there is a peregrine that's basically turned itself into the shape of a missile and is heading at over 200 miles an hour to go and probably pounce on a pigeon. Um, that is the fastest bird in the world and indeed the fastest animal, therefore. I'm um, quite often asked what are passerines and non-passerines and you know it's a it's a phrase that when I was a young birder I thought I probably need to know all this but I can tell you now I hardly ever need to know whether something's a non-passerine or a passerine. Passerines basically are the perching birds so the, the gold crest you can see there on the right is perching in a tree it's a passerine. The grey partridge on the left sort of perching but standing rather than perching is a non-passerine. So don't worry about it. It's, it's, you're never going to get asked that question. Uh, but you know, it's like Latin names. When I was about 10, I thought I had to learn all the Latin names of every bird in Britain, um, which uh, wasn't actually very useful at all. How many bird families? Well, this actually depends on who you talk to, because there are four major checklists of all the birds of the world, and they're all slightly different. Um, and they all except there are something between 10 and 11,000 species, but um, they all differ about how they split them all up. But around about 250, dif 250 different families of birds around the world. And there are people who really make it their life's work to try and see at least one of each of those, um, which is quite difficult to do because you've got to go all around the world to do that. It really is a massive job. So how good is eyesight? Well, bird's eyesight is good. It has to be good because they've got to be able to find prey. Um, many species of birds have eyesight that's 10 times more accurate than, than ours and, and sharper. For example, a kestrel can actually see um, an insect that's two millimeters long at a range of 20 meters. So that is very, very powerful indeed. And birds of prey, I mean, we all, we all have what's called a fovea at the back of the eye, and humans have one fovea. It's the point where all the things come together in focus. But raptors, <clears throat> like kestrels, they actually have two, which gives them extra ability to see very, very detail. The other amazing thing about birds is that they actually um, use the left and right eye for different things. Uh, I'll come on to that in one second. Kestrels can also see ultraviolet light and when they're hovering they can look down on the grass and they can see um, not grass the way we see it, they can actually see um, mouse pee. When, ma when mice are running through the grass they're peeing to, to mark their, their trail and basically the kestrel can see that because that is uh, shows up as ultraviolet light. 
So um, uh, we can't see that, they can, which helps them to, to catch the mice. An amazing skill. Um, and tawny owls, so how well can they see? So with tawny owls, um, they can see very, very well indeed. They can see at night as well. Um, I forget now what the figure was. I think it's something like 100 times more receptive to light at night. But their eyes are able to open during the day as well. So it's really very, very well adapted. But why does a robin cock its head? People often ask that. Is it listening? And they, people say it is listening. But actually, birds use the left and right eye for different things. So the left eye is used by most birds for looking at things in the distance. And the right eye is, is used for looking at things which are much more close. So if a bird is looking at another bird displaying, it will use its left eye. Um, and if it's looking down at a worm or something, it'll use its, use its right eye. And this is it's been found out really not that long ago. Um, and it's probably why a bird like a sun thrush or a robin seems to cock its head on one side. If you next time you see that, see if it's cocking its head to the right hand side like this one, which indicates it's using the right eye and therefore one for close up. Can they detect smell? Yeah, birds sometimes can, uh, but of course many don't need to smell if they're eating seeds and things like that. There's absolutely no need for that. So they have a very poor sense of smell. But the king vulture, which is found in South America, relies entirely on smelling dead animals, a dead cow or something in the forest or in the open plains and uh, is able to smell that from something like five kilometers away. The other thing they do <clears throat> is they watch each other very closely. So once one vulture goes down to the dead cow. The other vultures with their very good eyesight see the others, see it go down and they all follow each other, which is why you go from having one bird to having a hundred in no time at all. And uh, do birds have ears? Yes, they do. And here is the ear of an emu. On most birds, the ear is something you can't see, but you can see it very clearly there. And um, it is usually positioned at that location, at the back of the, um, the head there. And now one amazing thing about birds is they, they do sing very, very loud. Think of a wren. If you were a wren, the, the volume that you would be producing would be something like 120 decibels, which is like standing next to a rock band and putting your head in the loudspeakers. Um, now, if we did that, the hairs in our ears that allow us to hear would be damaged. And those hairs break down a bit like corn in a field with a big, big wind going through, pushes all the corn over. And in us, in humans and in mammals, those, those hairs do not regrow, which is why as we get older, we can't hear as well as we used to. In birds though, and at least half the birds now that have been studied, actually those hairs do regrow. And thank goodness, because if you're a bird singing loudly, you're probably destroying your hairs and your ears all the time. And so you wouldn't be able to sing and be an effective bird if you couldn't hear. So um, that's an amazing thing about birds. Again, I don't think that was known until quite recently. Now, are the ears on owls used for hearing? And this is a long-eared owl, beautiful bird. Uh, no, they're not. That is simply used as a, um, an additional way of visual signaling. So the owl can move those ear tufts. It actually can put them up, it can put them back. Uh, I don't think we fully understand how they use them, but we do know that owls in particular use visual stimuli um, rather than calling sometimes, and those are not for hearing. So I'm often asked about breeding strategies. How do birds nest? Why do they have so many different kinds of nests? So top left here, we've got a colony of guillemots, all clambering on a cliff. They're only there during the summer, but they're really close to each other. They each have just one egg. And on the top right, you've got some peregrine eggs. So four eggs just in the middle, only the four eggs. Bottom left, you've got blue tit, where you could have 15 or so, or maybe 10 uh, eggs. And then of course, you've got on the right hand side, you've got at the bottom right, a cuckoo which has a completely different strategy. Of course, cuckoo's strategy is to get there when there is an egg or eggs in the nest, take one of the eggs and lay one of its own. The fascinating thing about cuckoos is that they actually are of several types. So some cuckoos only do this to dunnocks because they can, they can produce an egg like a dunnock egg. Some only do it to metapipids because they can produce an egg that's like a metapipid egg. 
Some only do it to reed warblers because they can produce an egg like a reed warbler egg. When I was a boy, I assumed that cuckoos were a bit like a coffee machine. You would press a button, oh, we want a blue egg, so we'll do a blue egg in this nest and go on to this one that needs a green egg, do a green egg there and then go on to another one where it needs a brown egg. No, the cuckoo that was born in a Dunnock nest will have been laid by a female that was also born in a Dunnock nest and it's carried on through the genes. Female cuckoos will select the species that brought them up. So if you're a Dunnock and you're helping a cuckoo to survive, you're not really helping your species very much. Um, cuckoos are having some troubles at the moment uh, for various reasons. We can probably talk about that uh, a bit later. The other interesting thing about cuckoos is that of the world's cuckoos, of which there are around 170, I think, some of them actually do this where they just simply lay eggs in other birds' nests, maybe 10 or 15 a year. Some of them don't do any of that. They actually just make their own nest and rear young like other birds do. And some of them do both. And the ones that do both actually, first of all, go around, lay a whole bunch of eggs in other birds' nests. And then when they've done that, they then go and make their own nest. So they're using both strategies. Incredible. So the guillemot, yes, safety in numbers. Um, basically, they have to get on with each other very well. They're very careful about how they how they get on. Um, in fact, they quite often preen each other. Um, so guillemots in adjoining nests will, will preen each other in, in order to really build up the bond between neighbors so that they don't fall out. So um, it's an interesting strategy. It's called allopreening um, and male guillemots can do allopreening on other male guillemots or indeed other females. Um, so, and it doesn't seem to cause problems, but I wouldn't try it with your neighbor because uh, it might cause problem in the human world. Yeah, the blue tit, they lay one egg per day and um, they, uh, they wait until they've laid the whole lot. And what they do then is the female then incubates them and she wants them all to hatch on the same day. And because she's probably gonna lay 15, um, she, if, she, if she started from day one by incubating them, they'd all hatch over a 15 day period. It'd be absolute chaos. So she waits until she's laid them all, which is why you might find some eggs, touch them and think, oh, they're very cold. That's simply because she hasn't started incubating them yet. The peregrine though, lays an, e an egg every two days. And um, they don't, they, they, they actually uh, do something slightly different, which is that after the second or, well, after, probably after the third egg, that's when they start incubating. Now, what me that means is that the fourth egg will hatch two days later than all the others. And that's quite useful because if food is a bit short around the peregrine nest, it means that chick number four can be used as food, which is quite rough. I mean, if you're from a big family, you've probably experienced being bullied by your older brothers and sisters, but um, it really does happen in the world of peregrines and, and it's a good way of providing some food. Sometimes that last egg gets pushed to one side. And very often it's the one that's the palest in the clutch. Perhaps that one at the top left. Uh, I don't know if that's to indicate the female, that's the one to push to one side, but uh, it, or it maybe she's run out of pigment. Amazingly though, at Winchester, the female there laid five eggs. She hatched all five, she reared all five and they all flew. So what an amazing pair of birds those. And the cuckoo, yeah, the brood parasite, which I've talked about. So yes, cuckoos are impressive in that respect. We have two types of chick, really. We have nidifugus uh, and nidiculus chicks. Again, these are two words I thought I'd use when I was 10 years old, learned them. And this is about the second time I've had to use them since. But basically, a lapwing is the nidifugus one, where basically it's hatched. And on day one, it's walking around and looking after itself. You know, lapwing chicks feed themselves on their very first day. Whereas black cat, blackbirds, and indeed, frankly, most birds, sit in the nest looking useless for a couple of weeks at least um, and demand to be fed. Quite different strategies. So migration. A lot of birds migrate around the world. And uh, if we um, think about it, why on earth do they migrate. So it takes a huge amount of effort from them, amazing amount of energy, lots of them die in the process. Well, basically it's to find food um, because if you're something that eats insects, for example, a, a small bird, 
you, um, you, you, you need to think about the availability of insects. And there are lots of birds in Britain already that eat insects. So if you're a chiff chaff or a willow warbler or something, you'll probably think <clears throat> it's better to go down to Africa or maybe southern Europe to get insects rather than to stay here. It's not so much about avoiding the cold. They can live in the cold we have here. It's just they do need the food. Yep, a lot of birds though do migrate to, to avoid extreme cold. All the birds that come here from Scandinavia come here because it is very cold there. There'll be a lot of snow. Uh, you go to somewhere like uh, Finland in winter and there's just snow everywhere. It's very hard to find food. And basically it's to maximize the chance of survival. But you know, not all individuals within a population migrate. Some actually do stay behind. And we have some interesting things um, not long enough to talk about them tonight, but things like black caps, which spend the winter with us, and chiff chaffs that spend the winter with us. You know, you'd think of a black cap as a summer migrant. Interestingly, the black caps actually are, uh, the ones we have in winter are actually not our summering ones. They do come from Europe. They come from places like Germany, and our birds head down to Spain, so they all change places. Now, I don't know if this is going to work, but this is a, a slide with a, um, yeah, this should work. Let's see if we can make it work. Watch the screen, see if it happens. Yeah. So here is migration in action. And what we're seeing here, each of these dots is an individual bird that's been um, given a little tracker in North America where it's breeding. And uh, they put the tracker on to see where the bird moved to. And you can see that the date is running through. We're currently in September and they're heading down. It's autumn migration and they're heading down to South America. Um, so you can see how the population goes. But look, we're in December and not all of those birds travel all the way to South America, even though they all, pretty much all of them nested in North America. Some of them actually um, stay in the middle. So, so as birds migrate, they don't all go to the same place because if they did, my goodness, it would be crazy. It would be be hard work. There it goes again just once more. And by the way, it's not all the same species here on this, so there are a variety of different waters and things. And there they all go again. Now that's just an example of how we can use technology to track what birds do. And we're doing quite a lot of that in HOSS now. We're funding a number of people who are doing this work on, on things like woodlarks, curlews, and, uh, and other species such as wood warblers. All right, I'm hoping I can get out of this slide now. I can. Here are the main migration routes. So right the way down through America, down into South America, from Europe down into Africa, um, and from Asia, uh, or the northern parts of Siberia and whatever, down into Southern Asia and to Southeast Asia. So basically the migration routes are up and down. They are not basically from left to right. Although we do get birds, for example, like yellow-browed warblers that nest in you know, the Eastern parts of Russia and they end up here. And that is actually as a result of something that's called reverse migration. And it's happening with young birds, birds that are born this year. They, just like a plane that's got the um, compass in the wrong direction, they fly uh, to us rather than flying to Asia. So that's how we get some of these weird, weird discoveries. Um, they probably don't survive. They're young birds. Uh, they probably die, which is why it's young birds that do it, because adults, um, don't do it because if they did do it they'd have probably died in the process if you know what i mean right how do they navigate now this is an amazing one um birds basically have four sources of information for navigation so the first thing is they can see the position of the sun and that is something they can use to help them to understand which direction they're going in the sun is not always an option for them and a lot of them migrate actually at night the smaller birds in particular and uh, they spend their day feeding up and nighttime migrating. So they use the position of the stars. We don't know which stars they know, but we do know that if you put them in a planetarium and you create a fake layout of stars, they will go in the direction that the stars tell them they should go in. And if you reverse those around, they'll go the other way. We also know that they use magnetic fields. Whether they can all do that or just some of them is not clear yet, but they do have the ability to detect magnetic fields. And you can test that also by putting a false magnetic field around some birds in a laboratory, and then they will hop in the southerly direction uh, when the magnetic field is not put on. But once it's put on to reverse that, they start hopping north. And we now know also that some birds, seabirds, can actually smell their way around the world. 
How accurate that is, we don't know, but we do know that they can detect different kinds of smells within the sea. So it just goes to show that, you know, what we don't know about birds probably still exceeds what we do know already. Bird ringing, some of you may be bird ringers. It's the, the subject where you take um, a bird and you put a small ring on its leg, as we're doing there. It doesn't, um, well, it shouldn't hurt the bird, let's put it that way. Um, if you squeeze too hard and do it badly, of course it will, but we're all very carefully trained so that we don't do that. Um, and what's the point of it? Well, basically it tells us five things. It tells us the migration routes that birds take. So if you're marking birds here in Hampshire, and then they end up going down to Morocco, we know where they went, or if we've color ringed them, so they've got color rings on, we can see where they stop off on the way. And that's important because it means we can identify sites on their migratory routes, which are important to protect. Estuaries, for example, down the west side of France and Spain. It tells us the survival rates of birds and it tells us how long they live for. So if, if birds start to die earlier than they used to 20 years ago, that's something we can detect using ringing. Also, because we're handling the birds and we can weigh them and see how, what kind of condition they're in, it's like having a quick uh, checkup at the hospital. We can find out, you know, what sort of condition they're in. Are they having a bad time? Are they finding too little food? And finally, it will help us to understand the family relationships between birds. Do they stay together forever? Um, by colour ringing the birds, you can see that the same birds come back to the same sites. I work on, on stone curlews. It's the only bird I'm allowed to ring, which is quite bizarre because most bird ringers are not allowed to ring stone curlews, but I am. Um, and I'm able to see if the same birds come back to the same farms each year. Now, within a species, the migration can differ. Now, what we've got here is the yellow wagtail, which is a very widespread species. Um, indeed, there may be uh, several species involved there. We, we definitely know that the yellow wagtail actually really is two main forms. Uh, one in the west, one in the east, but I've just put them all together here for the point of this. And you can see that um, they head down, they, they nest in the areas that are yellow, and they head down and spend the winter in the areas that are blue. But the fascinating thing is that it doesn't just kind of move down like a piece of tracing paper. The yellow wagtails that nest at the very top, up in Norway, actually migrate to the very bottom. They are the ones that go the furthest in order to get to Africa. The ones <clears throat> that nest in Britain and Spain, they don't go as far. They probably go to the top of that blue patch. And you might think, well, well why would these birds from Norway go so far? Well, the reason is they can, because in Norway, it's, it's no good getting, getting back in March like the ones do with us. Uh, they have to get back in May because in March it's still covered in snow and indeed in May it's very often covered in snow too. So they arrive back in their breeding grounds really late. They only have one brood and they can afford to take a longer journey than everybody else. So by doing that they enable the birds that can actually get two broods in to actually have their wintering zone a bit nearer to home so they can get back in good time. It's amazing discoveries we're making and of course we find all that out through ringing. And we're doing quite a bit of satellite tracking now. You may remember that Hoss funded a cuckoo uh, known as Selborne and cuckoo, uh, Selborne was an amazing cuckoo. He was a record breaker. He was the first one to arrive back in Britain every year out of all the 30 or so cuckoos that were tracked. Um, he did it, I think at least three or four times. Uh, but by doing satellite tracking, we can see where they go and, and here are the cuckoos. Um, I put this slide together for a talk in February. And at that time you can see the cuckoos were down in West Africa, having all traveled down from Britain. And um, right now they are, um, are well on their way. They're in Africa already and heading back down across the Sahara. Incidentally, they cross the Sahara in one hop. They don't stop. So why do we use color rings? Here's one of my stone curlews. Now, no stone curlews were hurt during the making of this talk, uh, but here is a baby stone curlew um, lying on some very soft cloth. Um, upside down, face down, and I'm actually just putting the, the colour rings on the legs. So it, it means I can identify that bird as an individual in the future. Um, why do we use them? Well, because knowing about individuals helps us to know that uh, how long they've lived for. You know, I'm never going to have to go and retrap that stone curlew in order to know that he or she is still alive. So it enables us to study birds without disturbing them. 
I did get asked how do birds recognize each other and I actually have to say don't know. Um, on the left we've got, um, goodness me I have to think about this, right on the left we've got a willow tit and on the right we've got a marsh tit um, and these two birds are so similar um, that uh, it's very very hard to tell them apart and uh, you know uh, how do they do it? They mainly do it during using song. It's probably the quick answer to that one. Somebody asked me about climate change. Um, are birds adapting to climate change? And the answer is they are, but they're, they're adapting really quite slowly. Um, here's an example of the distribution of the willow tit um, up until, well, probably about 20 years ago. And if I just move it on, here is the distribution of willow tit that we predict that's going to be the case in the next um, 70 years or so. So in other words, the whole population is going to move north. But just go back, that's what it was, and that's what it's going to be. So basically as climate changes, things get warmer, birds that like to be in slightly cooler places head further north. And you know we do find that the willow tits in Hampshire are all up in the, the higher copses. Um, we're seeing changes in arrival dates of many birds. So for example, on the left, this is uh, the, the codes along the top are the species. So SM is San Martin. Um, the right hand end, uh, CK is Cuckoo and TD is Turtle Dove. Now, the bigger the, the bar, the earlier that bird now arrives compared to what it did used to arrive uh, back in the 1960s. So what you can see from that is that San Martins now arrive roughly 23 days earlier than they used to when I was a boy. Um, if you go to the other end, turtle dove and cuckoo are arriving pretty much the same time. Now in, in case of cuckoo it may well just be that cuckoos winter in places where they don't get any indication actually that the climate in the UK and Europe is any warmer than it used to be. So there's nothing there to stimulate them to head on further north, whereas San Martins winter further north and therefore they may well pick up on this and realize that actually it's worth flying further, further north earlier. The problems it creates for birds like cuckoos is that when they arrived in the 1960s on let's say the 10th of April, um, they would find lots of nests with eggs in and they could then lay their eggs and do what they do. Well now, because many birds in Britain nest earlier than they used to, cuckoos are now finding they're arriving on pretty much the same date as always, just a few days earlier. And instead of a nest of eggs, they're finding nests of chicks, which means that quite a lot of cuckoos have to really hunt around for nests with eggs. And, <clears throat> and in many cases, they have to wait for a second brood for those small birds so they can then take the egg and lay their egg the next time. So this will be potentially one thing that's driving down the cuckoo population but by all means not the only thing of course. So I was asked about this, so warmer springs are urging our resident birds to nest about two weeks earlier, so migrants that now arrive two weeks earlier are okay, uh, they're doing fine uh, and indeed they're finding places to nest as well. But those that arrive just a few days earlier are at a disadvantage. So for example, spotted flycatchers are arriving just a few days earlier than they used to. And I'd imagine they find many of the nesting sites they would want to use have now been taken up by other birds. I was asked about binoculars. Um, quick look at those. Um, there are two types. Um, mirror binoculars, the, the type we have uh, on the right hand side sorry, not on the left-hand side, and roof prism, which are the ones um, that uh, you've got on the, on, on the right. So basically, uh, two types of binocular, the, the expensive ones at the top of the range, Swarovski, Leica, Zeiss, generally going to spend something like £1,600 or so if you want a pair of those, but they are absolutely superb. And certainly companies like Swarovski give the most amazing um, product uh, uh, customer service. Um, if you if you haven't uh, yet got binoculars and you're looking to buy um, and you're not in the market for some expensive ones, then Optocron and Hawk are, are two very good brands. You could probably pay between six, 300 and 800 pounds um, and get something very good indeed. Um, but you know, not as expensive. Telescopes, the same applies. Um, you can you can spend a lot or, or not. Again, Optocron and Hawk come at around 600, Swarovski, well, anywhere between 1,500 and 3,000 pounds. 
uh, same for Leica, Zeiss and Kawa. Two types of telescope really though, um, straight or angled. Now when I was a boy, everybody had a, a straight telescope like the one on the left, so you'd look straight through it. And then we started to realize that actually if you want to look at a bird flying over you, it's better to have one that's got an angle. So pretty much everybody uses angled telescopes now. And uh, I do think they're, they're slightly better. Photography, big thing these days. Um, you've got two ways you can go on that. You could get um, a, a typical digital single lens reflex camera, like the one on the left-hand side that says Canon, um, something like a, a Canon ES, EOS 7D um, with a telephoto lens. And the favored uh, choice is the 100 to 400. So you're gonna spend about 2000 pounds, maybe a bit more for that. Um, I go for a different option, which is on the right-hand side, which is something called a bridge camera, much, much lighter, uh, and obviously a lot less expensive. And in that, the, the actual telephoto lens is built into the camera itself. So you just zoom it out when you want to take a photo. Um, you're not gonna get the same quality with the cheaper one, of course. Uh, but you know, I'm not trying to make loads of money out of taking photographs, I just wanna be able to take them. And I quite often find I'm getting photographs when people with big telephoto lens have had to give up. So, so um, I'd give that a go. The, the, the Canon SX70 is the one that I use and seems to be, at the moment anyway, the most popular amongst these bridge cameras. Get yourself a GPS is a good idea, or indeed, just simply get an app on your phone so you're able to see where you are. Um, really, really useful if you're out birding. And indeed, when you're sending us records at Hoss, it's really good to know exactly where you were, so, so use that. Um, information, get yourself the Hampshire Bird Atlas if you haven't already currently 25 pounds, um, the best book at the moment on, on, on where to watch birds in Hampshire, really superb. Got about 100 copies left uh, and it really is excellent. And that's what it looks like inside with maps showing distribution in winter and summer and also maps indicating changes in species and grass. So here's the firecrest uh, Mediterranean species that likes Britain so much now. Um, obviously you're probably all in Hoss already, but you may not look at the website much. So here's the website, loads of information on there, photos, site guides as well, which are being built up one by one. We're putting in play, you know, descriptions of where to go. Uh, you'll find that uh, uh, on one of those top, top um, indexes. We've got Going Birding, of course, which is the um, database of information as to what's been seen by birders in Hampshire today. Uh, just go on there, it's free for everyone to have a look at and really quick. Um, so if, if I saw a bird and posted that, it would be online within a couple of minutes or less. And Bird Guides is a good source of information. You have to pay for that, um, but you can get some of it for free, I think. And I do think they, they provide a very good service and lots of information. So questions. I've got a few, so I'm just going to quickly run through what they are. Um, one person asked me, um, birds live a lot longer than the equivalent sized mammals. Why is this and why do they need to do that from an evolutionary point of view? Well, certainly um, something like a wood mouse lives for a couple of years um, and a bird that is the same size as a wood mouse probably would live four or five years. But there's a big difference. Wood mice, um, they have five babies usually. But you know, they're sexually active after two months. So after another month, uh, you know, they can be parents and then grandparents and are, you know, <laughs> within about a year and a bit, they're great grandparents. So that is really why birds have to live a bit longer than um, small mammals, because they really have got to re replace themselves. Um, small birds, as I say, live three to four years in many cases, larger ones live for longer, and of course, some birds don't nest every year. Albatrosses nest every two years and lay just one egg. Um, and the juvenile albatross can only breed after maybe 10 years. So it's a really huge investment in replacing themselves. It's a bit like us. Um, the oldest bird in the world, incidentally, is a Laysan albatross by the name of Wisdom, a female. She is 69 years old and she's still breeding. So we're, we're able to watch her because she's ringed. We know where she's going to go and we can find out uh, whether she carries on breeding and rearing chicks. Somebody asked, um, I'm interested in knowing if any owl hotspots are in the area. Um, well, 
good time to look for owls. I think I've put a map on. Uh, let me just see if I can find it. Here we are. Yeah, so if you want to see owls, one of my favourite places is Brownsbury Common. That is just south of the A303 and just west of the A34. So uh, not that far from Andover and, and so on in the, in the Test Valley. I'll leave the slide on for a bit and you can see there. I've put um, some arrows and a little point. That's where you stand. You don't go wandering over Bransbury Common. You stand on a little hummock there. Um, towards the end of the day, the last two hours of daylight is the best and you are likely to get barn owls. You could get short-eared owls, depending on if there are any around this year. Occasionally we've had long-eared owl there as well. There are definitely tawny owls in the area, definitely little owls. So um, Bransbury Common's a good place. Where I park incidentally is where I've put the other circle where the junction of the road is just near the number 42 there. Um, so that was about owls. Somebody asked me, what is the latest count on nightingales in Hampshire? Well, you've probably got your Hampshire bird report in the last day or so. Um, unfortunately, the numbers are really low now. We just had five areas in 2019 with a total of 16 territorial birds. So I'm afraid nightingale is one of those birds that we're probably going to lose, but it's not just us. It's across the whole of England and nobody really fully understands why, because, you know, nightingales are very much a Mediterranean species. And here we are with a warming climate. So what is going on? Somebody asked, how do feathers grow? Well, feathers are made up of protein, uh, something called beta keratin. Um, and if you actually shave a bird, like a, a chicken, uh, you can see pimples on the body. And that's where the feathers grow through. Um, and they come through with a little protective coating, like a, a sheath. A bit like when you plant baby trees, you put a tree protector around it, a plastic um, cone. So this uh, sheath eventually um, falls apart it de degrades and, and therefore the actual feather that's growing underneath it will, will come out and be pushed out uh, into, the, into the world. Um, from the, the sort of central shaft of the, um, of the feather, the main feather, there are branches going off to the right and left. They're called barbs. Um, and you've also got on those something called barbules. And all these things lock together so that the feather works. Birds actually molt at least once, sometimes twice a year. I think there are some that even do it three times. Um, each species, interestingly, is different. Some will uh, actually molt before their migration. Some will molt after their migration. Birds like red kites, when the female is sitting on, on incubating the eggs and then looking after the chicks, she's at the nest for about two months without really leaving very much. So she, she actually molts during that time. But birds only lose a few feathers at a time, really, because otherwise they, they wouldn't be able to keep warm or fly. Quite a lot of the ducks though use an awful lot of their flight feathers in one go, which is why you don't see them fly very much in the autumn. Um, and indeed, if a feather does fall out, it actually uh, doesn't grow back until the next molt. Um, right, I've talked about climate change a fair bit, but there was a question saying, how is climate change, weather patterns and prevailing winds impacting on the movement of birds? Well, apart from what I talked about with, with climate change changing the way they're migrating, um, weather is changing, there's no doubt about it. Many, many more storms now. There was a huge storm um, over sort of northern Spain and southern France this spring, which really held up and indeed killed a lot of swifts and house martins and swallows. So yeah, more stormy weather is going to affect our birds. We know that wind directions are changing and wind speed is changing with climate change. Uh, wind can slow down birds and of course storms can push them off direction. So, you know, things like grey phalaropes turning up at uh, Pennington Marshes, they will have got there probably because they got blown off course. Question was, how important is garden feeding and what are the key times of the year? Well, it's important to feed birds in the garden in cold weather, especially giving them water as well, because they can't find water when it's below freezing. You don't need to feed them at other times of the year. Um, and indeed, there is an argument that feeding birds all the time actually keeps unfit birds alive longer than they really should be. So what they do is they end up taking up space uh, on the planet where the, you're getting in the way of the fit birds. So there is an argument that actually we should just let nature take its place in its course. Um, when, I, when identifying a bird, what are the key traits to look for? Um, so 
there is a phrase called jizz, which is general impression of size and shape. This is a, a wartime phrase looking at aircraft. How will you describe an aircraft? So basically, if you were gonna tell me about a bird you'd identified, I'd say, well, what is size? Uh, particularly, can you compare it with something else you saw it near to? What is the shape, you know, the neck, legs, beak? What are the colors and where are those colors? What kind of movement was it doing? Was it, was it running around? Was it hopping? Um, did it call? You know, and really the great thing these days is get a photo. Get a photo on your phone if you can. You don't actually have to worry um, too much about quality because we can still see what it is. Um, very quickly getting on to the last couple of questions. What percentage of birds mate for life? Um, well, about 90% of birds are monogamous. In other words, that they just have one partner. This is of all the world's birds, the 11,000. Um, but actually, most of those do change their partners. And indeed, some birds change their partners between broods. So they might have two broods in the air and they might, a female might have two different males uh, for each of those broods. Um, so they, they, they swap around a bit. And that's particularly the case in smaller birds. It's not so much in large birds. Large birds generally mate for life. Birds like swans, birds of prey, cranes and things like that. There are some fascinating things though in birds. I mean, horn buntings, the male can have up to three different females on three separate nests, which he will then visit and go and keep them all happy with food and, and so on. Um, so when you see a corn bunting, it could well be that it's got three nests. Maybe that's why they're doing so well at the moment. Um, and then you've got cases like the Dunnock, where um, if you're a female and you're listening to me telling you that and about the corn bunting and thinking, well, that's not very good, really, is it? Well, Dunnock, the, the, the female actually very often has a spare male that is in the garden. The main male doesn't know about the spare male, but the female does. And the female mates with the main male. He is the father of her chicks. The spare male is the one she mates with as well, uh, but she ejects his sperm. So he actually never becomes the father of any of her chicks, but he thinks he is. So he actually makes a lot of effort to actually feed her chicks. So it's really quite a good strategy that um, she's got two men running around. She is being faithful to one of them, sort of. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, she, she does have a lot of help from the second male as well. Oh yeah, I've got a question here about, sorry, there are two more. Um, production of insects. Um, they're making a difference to our birds, are they? Yeah, so a 77% decline in the number of insects recorded in Germany, for example, between 1989 and 2016. Now this was done on 63 nature reserves in Germany. And given that nature reserves are probably gonna have better numbers of insects than anywhere else, the fact that they declined by 77% is quite a concern. And it's probably very similar here. So yeah, birds need three things. They need somewhere to nest, they need somewhere to get food for their, their young, which is insects, and they need uh, food in the winter, which is usually seed. So yeah, insects are a big part of that, and that is indeed driving down some populations of birds. Um, and this combined question here, um, should we be culling magpies? They kill all of our nesting, small nesting birds. Well, yep, I mean, a local pair of magpies can absolutely decimate your birds in your garden, and I do sympathise with that. But work by the BTO and other organisations has shown that nationally it's not actually significant. There are about a million magpies in the UK. There are about eight million cats, and some work by the Smithsonian Institute showed that there are 90 million cats in the USA, and that they each um, kill uh, something in the region of... I think between 10 and 15 birds a year. So gives you an idea, no more than that. I think oh, yeah, it is about, it's, they, they kill about a billion birds a year, apparently, um, quite a big piece of research there. So I suspect actually magpies are having a bigger effect than, than um, actually uh, cats having a bigger impact than magpies. And final question, can we shoot rooks? They are tearing up my golf course. And the answer is, you can get a license to shoot rooks, but only if they are affecting livestock, foodstuffs, uh, crops and vegetables. So I'm afraid, um, no, the government won't allow you to kill rooks just because they're messing up your golf course. Um, so sorry about that. Um, I guess rooks have been here. I mean, I mean, golf's been going on for 500 years now. Rooks have probably been here a few million years. So I suppose they kind of get the upper hand for that reason. 
Right, I'm going to stop talking now. Uh, I'm going to let Barry come in. I'm going to say final thing. That's a really good book if you want to know about birds and how, how birds live. That will tell you an awful lot. And it's really well read, written. Barry, over to you. Hey, thanks. Thanks so much for that. Um, uh, fascinating and hopefully uh, lived up to everyone's expectations. Um, we've run over time just a little bit, so apologies for that, but not, not too much. And it looks like we've pretty much held on to practically everybody, um, even though we've slightly overrun. There were one or two extra questions, but mindful of, of the fact we've gone over time. What I'm going to suggest, and I'm sure Keith, you won't mind, um, is uh, if, and it's not always obvious from the... Uh, the code name or people sign ins on and, and who you necessarily are. Um, but if, if you'd like to post any questions, and I can see that's two, two there, I can see that did come in, there may be some others. If you'd like to still get answers to those questions, I'm sure Keith won't mind if you post them to us. I'm going to ask, suggest you can post them to uh, Nicola Whitmarsh, who, who sent out the invite in the first place. Um, so, and I'm sure we can feed those to Keith. And Keith, I'm putting you on the spot here. I'm sure you won't mind responding to, sure. to questions uh, on, on, on a post that we'll get this uh, talk tonight. Thank you everyone for taking part, part tonight. A uh, personal thank you also, so obviously to Keith for, for giving that fascinating uh, talk tonight. Um, a, a quick thank you to Nicola Whitmarsh behind the scenes as well. Nicola, thanks to Nicola, uh, played a key role in helping us set this up tonight uh, and, and very ably assisted me in making this happen. So a big thank you to Nicola. Uh, Keith's uh, talking again next week. We've got, as Keith may, may have said at the start tonight, um, next week's talk is on what to see uh, and where over the next three months or so. Um, popular sign up, we're actually running that uh, a, concurrently, two, two sessions on the same talk next week because of the number of people interested. I think we've, maybe we've still got space on the second run of that, of that talk. So if anyone who hasn't signed up for that, that would like to, then, uh, then please uh, register your interest via, uh, via Nicola. Uh, Marcus Ward is, is doing a, a, a talk on patch watching the week after. I'm sure that will equally be fascinating. And we've indicated a number of other topics um, that we're planning on running. We're, we're drawing up interest on those and, and, and we'll certainly aim to run further talks after this first session of three. But if there are other topics, topics that you'd be particularly interested in, in, in uh, participating in a talk, on a talk on, please do let us know. Uh, we're really keen, to, as, as both I and Keith have said tonight, to run a number of talks over the coming weeks uh, and potentially months, depending on how the uh, the, the, the next period of lockdown uh, lasts hopefully no longer than the month as planned. But um, thank you all for participating tonight. I hope you've all found it fascinating and look forward to hopefully welcoming you all to uh, further talks over the coming weeks. And Keith, thank you again. Um, so That's I'll, okay. I'll close the call, call off tonight and say a reminder of those of any questions that didn't get answered, which you really would love an answer to, please post them to Nicola and we'll aim to get a response back to you. And it'd be good to have some feedback too, uh, you know, what people thought. Yeah. Uh, I know I overran slightly, sorry about that. But uh, any ideas on how we can make it even better, then just let us know. Super. Thanks, everyone. Good night to everyone. Take care. That was great. Thank you. Good, good, good night, everyone. Good night. Bye.